How are you, April? How are you, April? I'm good, Diane. How are you? I'm great. Thank you. We had my daughter's wedding ceremony this weekend, our big day. We had a blast. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, it was just absolutely everything that I think she dreamed of and then some it was so so nice yeah that's yeah. wonderful yep proud mommy moment it just doesn't even seem possible right like oh my god how can she be 26 <laughs> yeah, years old start, no that'll get me going yeah, yeah. Any, I have to go <laughs> yep <laughs> yep yep so now we're back. Hello. How are you, Alicia? Hi. Good, thank you. I my audio was all messed up here. Some figured it out. Is Jeff joining us today? Do you know Diane? He is not. He had um, an appointment that he needed to get to, so he said he wouldn't be able to come today. Okay, and I know that Leanne um, is. Uh, be late is that what she said yeah yeah okay right. do you want me to put this on live stream uh yeah that would be great thank you okay let's see if it works okay so um, Good. thank you, Diane. We're here for the um, Scarborough Schools Policy Committee meeting on July 13th, 2021. Um, I sent out an agenda. I think I did it after the last meeting, which is like ridiculous for me, but 
I just realized that if yeah. I don't, that, that it's like, what day is today? Tuesday, that Tuesday sneaks up on me really quickly when we have these mm -hmm. meetings and yep. it's really overwhelming. No, I totally get it. Other thing I noticed is that it seems like a, an eternity since we, we meet the last time and, and I forget so much. Yeah. Well, um, I think like at our last meeting, we did so like, we brought all those other policies that we were working on to fruition, right? They're going to go to second reading on Thursday. So yeah. now we're kind of reestablishing where we're at. Starting anew. Yep. So the first um, policy that we have scheduled to review is ACAC, which relates to service animals. Mm -hmm. And Diane, thank you so much for getting sure. the policies for me, the, the sample policies. Yep. Um, so April, so that you know what Diane um, found is that ACAC is not a required policy. Okay. Um, and she did, so there's no sample from MSMA. She did um, provide a couple of um, samples from other districts that I put um, under the policies under review file. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. What I did um, in preparation for our meeting though is I sort of stopped there, which this was the, I got ready to start prepping this. And then I, okay, so it was last revised in our district in 2013. And I went to the statutory reference um, for definitions. And it looked like the definitions were um, probably outdated and, and not um, consistent with current statutory language. Okay. And a lot of times I like policies, even if they're not required, because I think that I like the concept of like informing practice. Mm -hmm. But in this case, um, was something so like strictly mandated by statute, I, I don't know that. I think that it makes sense for us to have a discussion if we want to keep a, a policy or not because of the risk, it, because it seems like it's a it's a pretty popular um, topic to, to for statutory change and it's easy for it to become outdated. And then if it's not a required policy, is that being triggered through Jumman Woodsum or whoever, you know, next year or the year after is the school's attorney and, and will that will that be brought to the school's attention? And then do we run a risk of being non-compliant because somebody erroneously relies on the policy and doesn't know the statute? Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that there was good reason to want to, for, for you know, when it was drafted and revised for, to want to have the policy. So um, I just think that that's something we should decide as a group if we want it and, and want to edit it or or if it's sort of one of these things that if, if it becomes an issue, we want that, you know, the lack of policy I think would trigger an administration reaching out to um, council to get advice. Right. Well, and I think, you know, I, I think what becomes part of the conversation in relationship to this is that um, kind of calling out what is a service animal versus what is a therapy animal, right? And, and those are two different things. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, so I had given you, I think, three different school districts. And again, you know, in terms of the adoption dates, they were a little bit different, right? Like I think yeah. balance was just in 2020, I have to go back and look at my email to see what the others were. Look. Um, yeah, Falmouth was 2020. Yeah, and then let's look. And again, the other interesting thing is like in Yarmouth, for example, it's, it's under a different code, IMGA. 
Um, and that was true in some other, uh, in some other cases too. Um, yeah, the, um, the one in Yarmouth was revised in 2018. And then I had one other one um, from MSAD 51. And that was revised in 2016. So they're, you know, so, so they all have a few different dates, but, um, you know, certainly the 2020 would be the most recent. But I think all of them, you know, the legal references that they provide can be helpful for us too. Mm -hmm. So do we have IMG animals in schools? I don't believe that we do because I looked for that as well. Let me just double check. Oh yeah, we do. And I'm also in the classroom. Yeah. And so see, so so our policy is IMGA. We have an IMGA policy. Interesting. Service animals right now. And that was adopted in 2008. So um, certainly we should probably re-examine this because this is where it's nested under service animals is IMGA. And found this obviously they nested theirs the other way and put prohibited animals in the classroom under policy ACA. But what's interesting is we also have policy ACAC. Right. So Which says that, that that, that says both? that it re replaces IMGA. Does it? Oh. So, so we probably shouldn't have both of those. Right. Like should decide. Yeah, it does say that. And this was revised in 2013. So, you know, so that's a good catch in terms of, um, first of all, an update that's needed. And then if we need to take IMGA off, you know, I think it's either deciding which of the two should stay. Yeah. So, oh, that's interesting because they're backwards. It makes me wonder like, Um, how do I phrase my question? Uh, for recommended policies, does that mean if we were looking at, because because I asked you under ACAC, if service animals was appropriately titled IMGA and not ACAC, which is what I thought it was, would mm -hmm. they have a recommended policy? I'm wondering, or do they have a recommended policy? Yeah, so I didn't reach out to Jem and Woodson because I was I was looking at the MSMA because we have free access to that. Yeah. Um, and um, so I wanted to start there first and they have model policies for all of the required policies um, that schools have to have. And so this isn't on the requirement list and so they didn't have a model policy. We can certainly circle back to Jem and Woodson. I just, you know, again, this morning I was in a meeting all morning and I also assumed that they wouldn't be able to turn it over for me, like. Do you have that list, Diane? Can you check and see it? I think my real question is, uh, now I have to find the letter. If, to ensure that IMGA is not a required policy either. Yep, let me look. Thank you. Required policies, and I'll send you this too. Thanks. Um, I am GA is not a required policy. Okay, good. And AC AC is also not a required policy. Okay. So I will send this to you right now. Thanks. So that you can all have it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I 
So uh, Leanne has in our um, in our database or whatever the Google Drive, I guess, for mm -hmm. for our committee, um, a list from Drummond Woodson that she had that lists required and recommended policies, but it's only um, current as of January nineteenth. So I wouldn't want to rely on it. That lists are the ACAC as recommended, not required. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wish they would give us like a synopsis. Um, let, me, let me double check that they didn't. Why they require recommend something when they don't require it? Well, I think if it's required, it's because it's by statute or a law uh -huh. versus a recommendation, which is more because it may come up and it's good to be proactive and prepared mm -hmm. in case that it might. That would be my assumption at least. So like this says service animals 2017 um, as recommended. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts, both of you? Well, you know, I can't take notes and think at the same time. Um, <laughs> so, <Same. laughs> so I think that, you know, we always get into this question of rec recommended versus required. It, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's something light or whether it's something, you know, really mm -hmm. serious. Um, I do feel better about the idea of not having a, a specific policy, um, given that it's covered by state statute. However, um, I don't want to then also get rid of uh, um, all of our policies around animals. So then if we were not going to have a policy ACAC, then I feel like we would need policy IMGA. Mm -hmm. Um, and if we're going to do that, then maybe we just adopt policy AC, AC and cover all of it, like similar to what found the fit. Okay. Yeah. And I guess I would agree that we position ourselves better, um, by having a policy um, on the books so that um, if the question is raised, we're able to respond to it in a more timely way than, oh, we've got to get our policy committee together and let's go through the process of first reading, second reading. That could really bog down a request, potentially. Okay. So. Um. I think my suggestion, um, just because it's so statutorily heavy and MSMA does not have a recommended policy, is that we um, defer this conversation to make sure that Drummond Woodson doesn't have uh, um, some model policy that that is I mean, Falmus looks great, but it, I don't know like what the the, 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 I just worry about all the statute. It's so like potentially litigious and it's so um, regulationly, it's covered by so many regulations that I don't wanna like just wing it. Sure. Yeah, no, I can definitely reach out to them. Okay, thank you.
So I think that no matter what though, we, um, need to figure out how we're going to get rid of IMJ off the, off the website and, um, what the, what the mechanism is to do that. I don't know that we need a vote if ACAC has been passed and it says that it really, that it replaces IMG, right? It looks like it's an oversight in terms of just never having gotten taken off. Okay. So I'm happy to ask Kelly to do that. Thank you. Um, do you think that you could ask her to put IMG as written into the ACAC Google Drive folder so that if we want to, to hijack any of that language, I don't know if we need to because um, uh, whether our ACAC includes all of that, but if it does have some stuff and it's gone, then we won't be able to like okay. yep. cut, cut and paste from that. Thank you. So I'm gonna get all of these servicing them all things. So we have B E D H and B E D H R next. is related to public participation. Mm -hmm. Board meetings. Um, and that one we did have a sample. Now, I think that the reason why we wanted to review this, if I remember correctly, is because we um, had the discussion about committee meetings and we talked about public participation and then we were like, well, is that why? <laughs> well, let's talk about public participation in general because it was cross-reference. The other reason is there was a statutory change in 2019 and this policy was um, last revised in 2017. Thank so you to uh, you know, be up to date with policy, uh, with statute, we really need to um, you know, just cross reference to make sure that um, we're addressing those changes. Okay. I always um, wonder when doing these, when there's been a statutory change, whether we should go to our, our policy mm -hmm. as a starting point or the policy we know is in compliance. And um, I'm more inclined to go to the policy that's in compliance just so that we know that our editing will be um, by choice and we know that mm -hmm. what what is in compliance, but is that a good um, way to do it from your perspective? Or yeah. do you have a different suggestion? I think whatever way that we just feel like you're most comfortable with, because we'll, you know, we'll kind of look at both, of, compare both of them anyway. So however you feel most comfortable. Okay. I think the model one, you know, obviously will include the language for the most up-to-date statutory changes, and then maybe we just cross-reference the existing policy to see, you know, either some really important pieces that you like about our current policy, 
and are those referenced um, in the update? I like that. Um, so I, I have two things in that drive. I don't know why. That I think that we had talked about this because if you look at it, like we put it in the drive on February 24th, 2020. Uh -huh. And so I think that was like right after we had gotten some legal guidance about the policy. And so if you take a look at that, um, it's somewhat similar. I think, I think the difference is it's got um, a narrative at the, you know, the 2020 document that's in our drive has a narrative um, more so than um, the model policy, right? So it's kind of backing it up a little bit. Um, so maybe what I should do is delete those 2020 policy so we're not getting confused. Mm -hmm. Sure. So are we on, are we in a, oh, you just moved it to trash. <laughs> My bad. No, no, no. I was, I want to make sure I'm on the same one as you. So the one that's titled BEDH1, is that the one you're working from? Or are you deleting that one? Yeah, that's, that's that the latest one. one that I pulled in today. Yeah. Right, so that is the one that currently sits in the model policy folder from MSMA. Okay. Great. So this is a three pager. Mm. Our meetings are conducted for the purpose of carrying on the official business of the school system. All uh, meetings of this file needs to be saved as a doc. Mm -hmm. The original file, I don't know. Do you know how to save it as a doc? Yeah, I'll do it and I'll put it in the folder. Thank I'll you. I thought that was a doc. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's because when you download it from their site, they're all in Word. Oh, I see. Thank okay. you. Uh, official, official. And then obviously you can save it in the folder. Okay, so I just shared it with you and now it's in a doc. So that'll be easier. Thank you. Put today's date on there. There we go. For consistency purposes, it's we don't call ourselves school board. We call ourselves board of education. Is that right? Yep. Sounds so formal. Meetings at the Scarborough Board of Education are open to the public. The public is cordially, cordially invited to attend and participate in board meetings as provided in this policy. This policy applies only to meetings of the full board, not to meetings of board subcommittees. I think that's appropriate, right? Because we did have the subcommittee portion addressed separately. Yep, and, and Melissa verified that any of our policies that um, govern full board meetings are separate um, and conditional from our um, meetings. Okay. Although board meetings are not public forums, the board will provide appropriate opportunities at its meetings for members of the public to express opinions and concerns related to the matters concerning education in the Scarborough Public Schools.
Right, and so the, the real change here from probably what our current practice looks like is that if you look at the statutory language, it just, it talks about, um, you know, just this generalized public comment period and doesn't necessarily tie it into agenda items. So that would be, um, that would be a change. That would be a significant change, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, and I think you can see the language for that like at the bottom of page one. Because again, the, the updated statutory language in 2019 broadened, you know, the language is broad on that. So I'm just looking at the agenda piece because why do I feel like we addressed some of this in a separate policy? That you think we have another policy? Is that what you're saying? Well, yeah, like um, maybe it's B E D B. Yeah, we just reviewed. Yeah, we just reviewed policy setting and. and roles of the chair, you know, to run the meeting and blah, blah, blah. Maybe that was part of our discussion. I don't know that it was necessarily specific to agenda setting though. Yeah, I don't see it in the agenda, B-E-D-B. B-E -E, maybe? Board of Education meetings. No, we haven't reviewed that. Okay, looks like it's fine. I just wanted to make sure that. Mm -hmm. No, that's short. The intent is to allow a fair and adequate opportunity for the public to be heard while ensuring that the time allowed for public discussion does not interfere with the fulfillment of the scheduled agenda. The board will designate a portion of its agenda as an opportunity for public participation. I don't know if I like the word participation more than comment. Comment. Oh, yay. Hi, Leanne. How are you? Um, <clears throat> well, there's nothing like policy committee to cheer up your mood. <laughs> Let me just bring you up to speed. We um, we looked at ACAC mm -hmm. and um, that's about service animals. We um, That's not a required policy, but it's a recommended policy. Diane got a um, few sort of sample policies from other school districts, but because it, so um, mandated under law, both federal and state law, I asked if she would mind just making sure that, um, see if there's anything that Drummond Woodsum has, because I'm a little bit hesitant about, you know, going at it alone. Um, when we pat when when ACAC was last reviewed, it it was supposed to um, replace IMG. IMG is still on the website, so. Um, Diane's going to talk to Kelly about getting that removed and then have the IMG language just be in our Google Drive for ACAC so that if there's any language that wasn't included in the most recent round of ACAC, we can hijack it and cut, cut and paste it if we um, think it's appropriate. IG, IMG is um, uh, related to animals in the school in general, so not, not necessarily service or therapy animals. And so we agreed that we would um, take that up at the next meeting after after we hear back from Drummond Woodsum so that we don't get into the muck on that. Okay. 
And um, now we've moved on to BEDH, which also has BEDHR and that's um, public participation at board meetings. And we've got the um, MSMA uh, sample policy. And this is a recommended policy as of January, 2019 from Drum and Woodson. Diane informed us that there was a statutory change in 2019. We last revised this policy in 2017 and the statutory change um, from her perspective uh, allows for public participation not related to agenda items only. Yeah. Um, so just sort of going through. also include the changes to the, one, the law that just recently went in with respect to um, public participation over Zoom at board meetings? Mm. Let's, let's look at how that interfaces. Um, I've got a recent... Right, so that um, is LD32. Um, it's emergency legislation that allows for remote participation in public proceedings going forward. It does require that we would have to adopt a policy that governs the conditions under which members of the body and the public may participate in a public proceeding by remote methods. I will say, um, interestingly enough, just as a, an aside, um, I know that the community that I live in, I saw that um, the superintendent just put out um, updated guidelines for public participation in meetings. And the way that they have listed them is that anyone can, um, watch the meeting remotely, but if you wanted to participate, you have to be in person. So I don't know how that interfaces with this. So I, I'm going on the legislative website and I see that it says final disposition, emergency signed June 21st. 2021. Um, just wondering when it becomes effective. It's emergency legislation, so that means it becomes effective right away. Hmm. I've never dealt with emergency legislation before. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Because it, it, if you click on the bottom part, it says um, usually it's not effective until 90 days after adjournment, unless enacted as emergencies. Um, just need one second. I've got to find my mute button. Okay. Right. Um, Main revised statutes, Title I, Section 403A. So I think that's where we can find the statute. I love learning something new. Mm -hmm. 403B. My job here is done. Thanks, Leanne. Here's 403A. Public proceeding through remote access during declaration of state of emergency due to COVID. Whole section te text effective until contingency. Whole section text repealed on contingency. Whoa, what does that mean? This 
This section is repealed 30 days after the termination of the state of emergency as set out in subsection one. Mm -hmm. Are we still under a state of emergency? No. But I thought that they had enacted that they were going to keep this because it improved participation so much. And so, so part of this legislation does require that members of the body are expected to be physically present for the proceeding. So for example, that means members of the board or members of the town council, right? That, um, that those people are expected to be physically present. So remote participation is the exception to the rule with the default being that members are in person. Um, How does that can, work? I'm gonna uh, email you the link to the statute, the way I'm reading it. If, if, if the um, state of emergency is no longer in effect is that the statute is, and it looks like it's repealed, but. I know that the town council had this conversation, but the details are, are not coming back to me because I know that Tom Hall presented it to the mm -hmm. town um, a couple weeks ago. Yep. Adopted amendments. Final disposition. It was signed on June 21st. Did you get it, Leanne? No, yeah, hold on, let me flip over. Yep, there it is. So yeah, I guess that is a like I think you raised a great question, Alicia, because it says that um, it is automatically repealed thirty days after the termination of the state of emergency. So if the state of emergency was ended on June 30th, then what we're talking about here would be repealed on July 30th. So for, I mean, and I think members of the body are different than members of the public. Public, right. Right. Yeah. Like this, this legislation doesn't talk a lot about members of the public. It, it focuses more on members of the, um, the body. Well, I just found an email I'm gonna send to you guys. Okay. Right, and then there are specific circumstances in which physical presence isn't practicable. And that's if there's an emergency or urgent issue for a member, if there is an illness or physical condition for travel, distance, or impeded by slow travel. So if you're stuck in traffic, you can participate remotely. <laughs> oh, there it is. And I knew I I knew we had received Yeah, and that's the one that I had looked at, that same email prior to Leanne. Thank you for sharing that.
So again, the focus seems to be more so on members. Yeah. So this is for people to make public comment at a board meeting, it, whether we're required to do that through um, electronic format. And, and it looks like that requirement has. Right, that's not a requirement to allow that public. Until, until June 30th though, right? July 30th. July 30th, yeah. Well, I think I if know, you, that conflicts if, with yeah if you read the the public law um, it's really it doesn't speak to members of the public it speaks to members of the body so I'm not even sure that these two are related although 2a is saying that after notice and hearing the body has adopted a written policy governing the conditions upon which members of the body and the public may participate in a public proceeding of that body by remote methods. Right, but what I guess what I'm trying to say, Leanne, is it's not saying the legislation doesn't require participation by remote methods. The legislation is saying that we adopt a policy and explain what we see our own conditions as being. So that's still a local decision. It's not legislated by um, the government. Gotcha. Yes, I agree with that. I find that, I don't know that I would read the Tom's either because that to me is really confusing. Mm -hmm. the, 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 because it's, the proposed legislation, and then it's got the committee amendment, and then it's whatever right. was actually- I went to the statute. Yeah. That was passed. If I look. Yeah, so, you know, so like I said, um, you know, in the town that I live in, in Saco, they had, they had just posted their updated public participation. And so beginning July 14th, members of the public may attend school board meetings um, in person to speak during public comment, use the sign in sheet when the board reaches public comment or votes. Right, people will be allowed to speak. Each member of the public who participates in public comment is asked to keep their comments to a maximum of three minutes. And then they say that you can watch the school board me me meetings, um, but to give public comment or participate in a public hearing, you must attend in person. That's, that's how they've defined that. And then they're saying that you can watch it live stream on Facebook, on their SACO TV channel, on their shared education government channel, on their channel three, channel 1301, on public <laughs> access, da, 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 da. So anyway, that's just, you know, to, to give a point of comparison in terms of, you know, how are other people looking at it? And obviously you can make your own local decision. So yeah, so keep in mind, Leon, that's um, what what the schools had to do during the state of emergency. I mean, if that's something that you want to advocate for to continue, I don't think there's a prohibition from that that right, I'm aware right. of, right? So I mean, that's a that's something that we could talk about logistically whether that's you know I think it, that's a valuable discussion, right? Like. Um, public access versus um, the risks associated with conducting those that portion of the meeting remotely. 
Well, and it puts us in a position, can we launch into the discussion? Are we ready? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so it, so it puts us in a position of being in violation of our policy if we don't have a way for the public to participate remotely. And given the technical challenges we've had, that aspect makes me a little nervous because I would want to make sure that we had mm -hmm. very clear IT. And that's not, I mean, it's not an obstacle we can't overcome, but we do, it is something to take into consideration because, you know, I literally made the decision to hold the meeting, to go forward with the meeting, you know, two weeks ago or three weeks ago now. And without that Zoom component, if it's in our policy that the public is allowed to participate that way, you know, we just have to make sure that we have all of our technical pieces in place every single time we meet as a body, which is fine, but it's something we need to take into consideration. Um, and then I also, lean to your point, like I don't think that the um, local decision to grant exception for the board members being present. Like, I don't, I don't think that that necessarily has to be laid out any more clearly than already is. I mean, if travel is a valid reason to attend remotely, like that seems like it's at the discretion, local discretion to me. So, I mean, for, for me, like, I, I think that, we, you know, if we decided that this is something that we value and something we wanted included in policy, I think we could word it so that it says, you know, when practicable or, or something like that, or when, you know, technology allowing or, or something like that, you know, we could put in the caveats that would consider the potential technological difficulties that we may have or that we've seen that we've had from time to time. Um, I, I would, I, I agree that that has been a, rea a reality in trying to solicit uh, remote participation from both board members and the public. Um, some of the other concerns that I've had is that, is that I feel like it, um, well, I, I like the fact that I think it has um, improved public participation. I um, I feel as though there's um, uh, some some of the value is lost when it's when people are not on camera and not we're not able to have like a face to face conversation. I think that it's um, easier to not follow all of the rules under those circumstances when you're just when it's just audio. Um, but that, but that does, and, and I worry, and I worry, sorry about the Zoom bombings. We've been fortunate, but that's, you know, one of the other things that I worry about, um, but I'm not opposed to it. And what are your thoughts? Um, well, some of it is a little on the personal side because I do need to seek the exemption on being in public for right now um because of health thing but i think i like the fact that we have better participation and that people can be engaged and they know what's going on um it would feel like we were taking a huge step backwards in our processes if we didn't allow for this to continue um and i think that's been one of the pieces that has been most beneficial in ensuring that things are running more smoothly across the board because someone can see what's happening. They do have that opportunity to be engaged and it's not always easy to scuttle from, you know, from work to a sporting event to be part of a board meeting mm -hmm. as a parent and this allows it. But yes, yeah, so I feel a little bit awkward because I'm advocating for something for personal reasons. And I know that that's a really bad move, so. I don't think it is for personal reasons because I, I mean, your participation as a board member is, is authorized through local control. And so it's really, it may give you sort of more empathy to, to pub, for those in public participation and why, you know, to advocate on their behalf. But I, I don't think it's a, a, a personal reason. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, it would just, it'd be super hypocritical for me to be able to have that, but not allow somebody else who was in the same position I was in to not be able to participate. Mm -hmm. Well, then to your point, you know, once we have the technology piece in place, it is hard to take it away. Like, why would we, you know, what is the justification for removing that channel if, you know, if we do have it in play? I was thinking about committee meetings the other day and someone, I, I forget which committee is meeting in person. And I was like, oh, how will I watch it? Like a creeper on my phone. Like, you know, it's, it's going to be weird when we go back to in-person meetings because we don't have the technology to record um, you know, all of our committee meetings, um, unless we can get chambers. And that was a problem before we, before COVID even happened. Mm -hmm. getting, so well, we did get them recorded fairly well with the portable video. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, a April as, and, and Leanne too, and, and well, all three of you, I really, I mean, have there been any other than sort of the technological occasional glitches that has prohibited us from operating the way we wanted to? Have there been any other concerns that you've had about public participation through remote means? Um, the only concern, uh, as I shake my head no and then say, yes, yes, I have a concern. Um, I think my biggest concern are the people who have written in comments but been on the zoom that to me is a huge violation if you if you're going to participate participate um again feels a little judgy but it's you know if we're going to open up the pathway the pathway needs to be there so it sort of feels as though either you can participate over the zoom portion or you can do a submitted written statement but I don't think we should be allowing for both. I don't I even know if I support the written statement, honestly, when, because I felt like that was really, um, first of all, there were people that that um, wrote and chose not to speak and then April and or Kelly were left to read it. And I just felt like it was really, even with Kelly reading it, it, you know, it just was really uncomfortable. And, and so, if, you know, if you play out different scenarios, you can see where somebody might have a criticism aimed at the school district and somebody else could view, view it and hear Kelly speak, saying that. And, and it just doesn't, for me, it doesn't feel good. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. Yeah, I think we can all just, I think we can acknowledge that that was something we did as an emergency provision that we no longer necessarily need that emerge. That was like, what do we do? How do we make sure right. that people have access to us in this unprecedented circumstance? We're, we've now come out of the crises of managing meetings. And I don't think that that's something that we necessarily need to continue to offer. Right. Um, and that's that being said, if a constituent emailed the board at three o'clock and said, I was planning on being at a meeting, I desperately wanted to make this statement, but I'm not going to be able to be there, I would, I can't imagine that the board wouldn't oblige and have it read into the public record as a extenuating circumstance, but as having like a standard operating protocol for allowing public comment over email, I don't, I don't, I think we all agree that that is not something we would want to move forward with. So we'll keep some pieces, but then <laughs> acknowledge that not all of the pieces are something we want to take with us. Great. So now what am I doing here? Uh, Leanne, we're on BEDH, and I think it's the only draft in the, um, under the policies under review, just so you know, if you-, if you okay, so I'm gonna hop in now. Um, so we said, where were we? Oh, the board will designate a portion of its agenda as an opportunity for public participation. And then I think we agreed that we wanted to change that to public comment, not mm -hmm. public participation. Right. 
during the time allotted for public participation. I'm gonna change that to comment too. Members of the public may speak on any subject directly related to the operations of the schools, except for personal matters or complaints concerning specific employees or students, which shall be addressed through established policies and procedures. Yeah. Meant to say personal matters and not personnel matters, I'm assuming. I don't know. I think it's personal. Okay. Because then it talks, because it's something that's personal to you and it brings up employees or students, right? Yeah. So I might personally say, um, I'm unhappy that this child who's in my son's class did such and such. That would be really inappropriate to do in a public meeting, right? Yeah. So I think yeah. that's what it speaks to. Okay. Optional additional language, public comment may also be invited just prior to board discussion of individual or specific agenda items requiring board action. Yeah, so I actually had gone to a training with Drummond Woodson right after this had gone into legislation and I, um, I vividly remember this part of the conversation and it was really that, um, local decision on, <coughs> excuse me, whether you place a general public comment period or whether you have public comment after each individual agenda item. And okay. so, you know, so, so those are the, the two optional pathways. Would it be after or before Diane that the topic was brought forward? Oh, yeah, it does look like just it's prior. Sorry. Thank you for the correction. I just wanted to make sure because I was trying to think it right. right. Of yeah, you know, and again, that is, uh, you know, a local decision. Um, I think the one piece of the discussion that I do recall is that um, obviously that could really extend the length of a meeting if you had, you know, public comment before number one, public comment before number two, public comment before number three. And if public comment is just defined as not necessarily even related to the item, right? In, yeah, it, so in terms of the meeting running in an organized fashion, it, it, it might bog things down. In town, that's what town council does, right? They take general public comment at the beginning and, he, and that general public comment is specific to things that are not on the agenda. And then they take public comment that is specific to agenda items as they make their way through the agenda. I just wonder, like for, for me, I, I personal preference aside, and I don't even know if I have one, but I just wonder if we need to prescribe that level of detail in our policy other than just public comment will be allowed. I mean, because like, let's say we wanted to change it. it I mean, this wouldn't prevent us. And then if it didn't work, we could go back to the, the, the way we were doing it before. And I don't know if that's a bad thing. I, I can appreciate um, that there are definitely times when we would like to separate public comment. Um, you know, when we have two topics that generate a lot of public interest, sometimes it's hard as a board member to hear all the public comment kind of jumbled together. And I think that that's not a very fulfilling experience as a commenter either, because then the conversation may not happen for another hour and a half after you've made your public comment. Um, so for me, giving the chair and the superintendent the discretion to insert public comment if they anticipate um, a lot of public interest is perfect. You know, I like having the that discretionary choice. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Okay, so then um, I think that what we could do is is um, 
just delete that optional additional language if that works for everybody. Is that a yes? Yep. No. yes. Strike it out. Okay. An inappropriate yes. <laughs> okay. And then members of the public may address the board within the guidelines provided in this policy. Chair shall be responsible for maintaining proper order and compliance with these guidelines. The following guidelines shall apply to public participation at board meetings. Citizens and employees of the school unit are welcome to participate as provided in this policy. Others may, citizens actually we should talk about, uh, what's the, what is a citizen? I'm, I'm gonna like, look it up do you have to be a it's not a resident yeah it's a good question mm -hmm. well it's a legalized recognized subject or an inhabitant of a particular town or city? Well, everybody's a citizen then. Correct. Unless if they live a mountainside, I guess. But I think that the inference, mm -hmm. I think that the language is somewhat ambiguous, right? Because it could be interpreted as, well, this is a Scarborough public meeting. And so therefore a citizen refers to a Scarborough resident as a citizen. And then the question is, is that something that, that we wanna prohibit non-residents from speaking at our um, school board meetings? So on what basis would you imagine non-residents needing to speak on Scarborough issues? Um, Other than employees? A special interest group that is opposed to COVID policies or protocols coming and gobbling up large amounts of public comment time. We've been very fortunate. I mean, the town council occasionally gets special interest groups that without non-resident commenters. I mean, I think that's one of those things that you know, it's tough to prevent mm -hmm. and you have to just accept that that might happen from time to time. Right. It could be national folks who come in and talk about contracts. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, we, we did have that. We sure did. For unions, mm -hmm. yeah. And, and I mean, from my perspective, even though it's the local school board, I mean, it is still, an arm of the government. And so for, for me, I'm, I think that it's sort of like part of who we are as Americans that, that we are open to having that discourse. And if the rules apply, you know, apply, then, then I don't see it as a problem. The only time I can envision it being a problem if there is if there was like a large, um, special action group and, and they showed up with a large constituency and, and try to monopolize the meeting. And I, I want to read the rest of this sample to see if there's, if it addresses that. Um, I would just say that for me, I agree that the discourse is good, except that it's only a one way conversation. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that we cannot reply or retort or correct a lot of misstatements are made, um, inaccurate information based on whoever gave the person from away the data. And that can perpetuate all sorts of problems. But isn't that true for public comment in general, uh, that it's? It is. Um, it is. I, I guess it was just more that I would hope that somebody who was local might have more facts than somebody who came in as a hired gun from away. That's all. Yeah. Well, why don't I highlight it? Um, 
Yeah, I think we should keep going down to, I, th I think that in terms of running an orderly meeting, like the chair has the authority, maybe even Leanne to call a recess or to end public comment if that, if things were really, you know, not applicable to Scarborough mm -hmm. Public Board of Education proceedings. Okay, citizens and employees of the school unit are welcome to participate as provided in this policy. Others may be recognized to speak at the chair's discretion. I'm gonna highlight that as well. Individual employees and or employee groups will not be permitted to discuss matters for which complaint or grievance procedures are provided. The chair may limit the time allotted for comments on a particular topic as well as the time each individual may speak. So I guess there is the place where if we go back and look at some of the notes that were attached to this model policy is where if you want to have time limits for people just as a matter of consistency from meeting to meeting, I, I don't know where you sit on that, right? Because otherwise, if it's each meeting at the discretion, like today, I feel like five minutes, next meeting, I feel like 10 today, you know, the one after that is three minutes. So then there's just a consistent rule. This would probably be the place to put that. Leanne, speaking from personal experience, having run meetings, what do you think? Um, I, uh, I don't want to handcuff the chair. Um, because if there's, if there is something that is, that people are passionate about and they're out in force, I think to say I'm only going to allow one hour of public comment per policy seems incredibly restrictive. But at the same range, I wouldn't want to put, we're going to allow three hours of public comment if it's the same comment across the board, because you might say I have 300 people in the room and you each get a minute instead of a three minute time frame. Um, hmm. I just think that we need to have some flexibility and understanding and faith in the chair to make the right call at the right moment and not lock them down into the corner. What do you think, April? I like rules. <laughs> <laughs> I like expectations. Um, so for me, you know, having that consistent three minutes, uh, that, but that, I mean, that's as simple as saying, I'm going to allow three minutes at the beginning of every meeting. And for me, that's not, you know, that's, that's easy. Mm -hmm. um, and I do agree with you, like there are extenuating circumstances that come up that being bound by a public policy, a public comment policy that's really restrictive would be very challenging. Mm -hmm. um, there is quite a bit of discretion involved um, just in maintaining the general flow of a meeting sometimes. Right. You know, and if you were going to say, it's like, let's just go to an extreme, it's an hour of topic, all right? Is that an hour for general comments, an hour for new business? Is it for each item under new business? At where do you draw the line? Does this clearly say that the chair dictates the length of people's public comment? Yep. It says you may limit it. And so again, you know, there are two ways to look at that. Like I totally see both sides of it. I see what Leanne is saying in terms of, you know, you want the opportunity to have the discretion. On the other side of that is, are you gonna be judged for using that discretion differently according to topic and or individuals? I mean, I remember when I was in line for to make a public comment and and as a just as a parent and the um, chair tried to stop public comment 
um, and I was the last person in line. And it's like you, you want to provide as much discretion as possible um, to, to maintain an orderly meeting, to shift according to the events as they are occurring in real time. But I mean, I do think that it's important to acknowledge that that discretion has the potential of being abused yeah. or providing unfair opportunities. Yeah, I mean, it opens the chair up to accepting three minutes of public comment on a non-controversial issue that's really important to people. Um, and then the following meeting, you know, saying, oh gosh, we can't take three minutes from all these people, let's just do one minute. And it seems like a benign decision in that minute, you know, in that second. And then, yeah, you know, then, then inadvertently you've given preference to the group that spoke in June, you know, as opposed to the group that now wants to speak in September. And that's not your intention, but it can And that be was never happen. your, yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you were gonna say, I'm only gonna allow, if we're gonna get so prescriptive on it and you're only gonna allow 60 minutes of public comment, if it is something that is incredibly controversial or there is a lot of passion around it, are you not allowing public discourse because you're following the policy that says, I'm only going to allow 60 minutes and I'm sorry, but you're person 21, Alicia, you're done. You don't get a choice. See, and I would never limit it. I would not be in favor or advocate for limiting the length of time right. overall. Yeah. But individual. Or just yes. we want to put in policy that each person gets three minutes. I, I agree. I, 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 um, I, I do worry that like limiting the time, I mean, a one minute is really not a lot of time for somebody to make a point. Um, I, I kind of feel like whether, you know, everybody's saying the same thing or not, I kind of feel like it's what we signed up for. And I don't know where you all just fell in that discussion. I apologize, I had to, and I have to, may have to take another call um, and I apologize for that, but um, I kind of feel like that's where what what we've signed up for is if if they want to come and give their three minutes, we're we've signed up to listen to it. That that's that's where I'm at on that. So. Um, The chair may limit the time allotted for comments on a particular topic, as well as the time each individual may speak. So not knowing what, what the results of your conversation was, my proposal would be to say, the chair may limit um, the time. Actually, I, I, I would probably get rid of B and, and I would say in the event of a sizable audience, the chair may require persons interested in speaking to sign up so they may be called on in a fair and efficient manner. And then just say the chair may limit the time in which each individual may speak under that sizable audience portion. Would you? refer to it as a limit of time or the number of speakers? I would not be, I don't, I don't support limiting the number of speakers. I would only support limiting the number, the amount of time each individual may speak. I don't support either. I think yeah. I just, I'm just saying for me, I would just give every person three minutes. And if 400 people want to speak, then buckle up everybody because you yeah. get your three minutes. That yeah. is the most fair, you know what to expect. And you know, it is what it is. Again, I like her cool. topic, correct? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if we, I like the idea of breaking the agenda. Um, so yeah, you would get to speak about 
um, roller skates and then you would get to speak about toasters and you get three minutes each time if you feel really passionate about roller skates and toasters. I just want to make sure that if we're going to be, if we're going to be clear, we're going to be really clear. <laughs> it's, I mean, it could be a lot. I mean, we, we know how these things bubble up. Um, but I, I tend to lean more towards if people prepare statements. I mean, I, we've been in that position where, you know, we've worked really hard on our words and we've written things down and we've shown up and we've stood in a nervous line and we've gotten ready. And then to be told, well, it's getting on eight o'clock. So I'm going to ask everyone to please, if you haven't spoken to please take your seats. Like, oh, oh, brutal. What, what, so what was your point, Leanne? You wanted to limit it? Um, I didn't want to have limits in the policy that it was the chair's discretion. You don't want the chair to have the discretion? Is that what you're saying? I want the chair to have discretion. I want the chair to have discretion. Absolutely, because I don't agree with putting... Did she just walk up? Froze. She did. Oh yeah, froze. She's that's saying that she doesn't want to put limits. I think that's what she was saying. You froze, Leanne. Yeah, I saw that after um, I talked for like a dog's pack of time. Um, how much did you hear? <laughs> Very little. Okay, um, I am not in favor of there being any sort of policy limits. I'm just not. I don't want a number of speakers I don't want time limits. Um, it's chair's discretion. If the chair wants to say it can be 13 hours of public comments, so be it. You're right, it's what we've signed up for, but I also don't wanna put in there, you get 90 minutes and we really needed two hours and under policy, we have to tell somebody to go away. I don't like that. Mm -hmm. I don't wanna tell anybody to go away either. So what if we just take out B altogether? And I know it sounded so disrespectful the way that I said it, and that's not what I meant. It did. No. April, are you it, are you good with taking B out? Sure. Oh, geez, I don't know what I did. I thought I understood that that was what you were saying. Okay, in the event of a sizable audience, the chair may require persons interested in speaking to sign up so they may be called on in a fair and efficient manner. Sure. Is that something that we need? Like, if I think about um, my past experience with board meetings um, in, you know, over my career, I think if there has been a, a topic that has a considerable interest in people participating, it may be uh, difficult to have all those people line up, uh -huh. stay standing in line for a period of time, um, you know, depending on the location of the meeting and the setup and so on. So um, I think that is the reason why that's in that model policy. I, I was gonna say, usually things are in policies and laws for a reason. Mm -hmm. The only thing that I don't like about that is that if somebody comes in late, then- like I think there's just a, the way I've seen it in other districts, right? Because I haven't seen it here. Um, the way I've seen it um, happen in other districts is they use a sign-in sheet right next to the agendas as people come in. So if you are interested, you know, and again, not that you have to do it for every meeting, but, you know, people would sign on there right away. So then that way that wouldn't get lost, right? And that there was one Loca set location every time so people knew that 
that that's where they would go to do that. Okay. During the time set aside for public participation, the chair will be responsible for recognizing all speakers who must identify themselves as they begin talking. Historically, we've required people to um, provide their address too. Mm -hmm. I've always thought that that was to ensure that they're a resident of Scarborough. I thought it was more for public record so that if you ever needed to go back um, for any reason for someone, like if you needed to get clarification or you needed to get other information to them, um, there was a way to know who they were. So it'd be, you know, where I live in Scarborough if you needed to find I, I, uh, there have been a couple of times where I've like not liked the address rule. Um, Well, for me personally, I, I work in an area where I don't like to have my address identified anywhere if possible. I've also felt that way when I've heard teachers speak, I've had concern for them to, to identify their, um, their address. And then, um, and then I've also had frustration because I think that like the rules should apply to everybody equally and so you know I, I've had concern about like what does this mean when one of our teachers has is you know expected to provide their address on the other hand I could see why they would not want to um admittedly I don't enforce the address rule <laughs> um I, I identify yourself with your first and last name um has been fine with me um, and I feel like this is ambiguous enough that it certainly doesn't call for them to provide their address. And really, I don't see any reason why we need to have people's street address. I, I, I'm sure at one point there was like a specific reason, but if we're not gonna limit public comment to just citizens of Scarborough and you're not trying to like verify your address, then I don't see why you would necessarily have to say it. Okay. Speakers are not permitted to share gossip, make defamatory comments, or use abusive or vulgar language. All speakers are to address the chair. Please stop me, by the way, if you have a comment on, or something that you want to propose as a change. All speakers are to address the chair and direct questions or comments to particular... Wait, what? All speakers are to address the chair and direct questions or comments to particular board members or the super superintendent only with approval of the chair that's different than yeah what we do currently well i don't like that um okay that makes me super uncomfortable yeah it seems really formal too like i've never once heard a public commenter request through the chair to ask the superintendent a question like we don't that's not what we and the, Yeah, and the um, statute doesn't state that. Yeah, can we strike that part out? Because it's just, A, to your point, April, it's way too um, formal. But B, I think it would be really uncomfortable for, you know, if there was a bunch of speakers saying, Leanne, can you please explain why you did this, this, and this, and I can't respond to it? That's just a real, it feels a little bit, dirty it's one thing to have it come at the full board yeah but it's very different when it's directed to somebody who can't react or respond or you know clarify yeah well also one of the basic tenets of being a board member is that we don't operate individually as board members and so uh, you know i think that that's sort of contrary to that that mm -hmm. tenet so what I did was I struck out, I, I just left it as all speakers are to address the chair and struck out the rest of that sentence. Yep, that looks perfect. Requests for information or concerns that require further research may be referred to the superintendent to be addressed at a later time. <coughs> Sorry. And I'm gonna, what if we say, and um, 
and is subject to freedom of information laws. Or is that necessary? No, because those apply anyways. Right. Requests for information or concerns that require further research may refer to the superintendent. Yeah. That's fine. Members of the board and the superintendent may ask questions of any person who addresses the board but are expected to refrain from arguing or debating issues. Questions must be addressed through the chair. That seems really similar to what you just struck out, mm -hmm. right? Because it's supposed to be a comment, not a dialogue or a conversation. Yeah. Is everybody in support with, with striking out section G? Yes. April answer? Yes, that's fine. Oh, sorry. you are? Oh, sorry. Every time I strike through, I lose my, um, I lose your, your faces. Yes, right. and I'm going back and forth to answer away from me. No complaints or allegations will be allowed at board meetings concerning any person employed by the school system or against per particular students. Personal matters or complaints concerning student or staff issues will not be considered in a public meeting, but will be referred through established policies and procedures. Can we also include board members in that? Isn't that covered by a separate policy about board member conduct? Maybe, I think it was, again, it just comes back to the comment should be general comment and not saying Jeez. Oh, oh, I see. I misunderstood your. Yeah, no, no. It's because we're talking about complaint to allegations about exactly. employees and students, but I think it needs to cover individual board members because to Alicia's, a point, Alicia's point, we aren't independent in our actions. Look, I don't know how I feel about that one, though. The reason why I, the, so the, the reason why I think that um, that provision is there, and, and trust me, I don't like getting clients, but <laughs> it's not fun. Um, but but uh, the reason why I think that provision is there is because we have a confidentiality issues, right? And then we have the procedures mm -hmm. to take if there are like student conduct issues or behavioral issues, or if there are personnel issues. And so grieving them in public wouldn't necessarily be the appropriate place, but what's the avenue for a citizen? It, let's say I was going rogue and what's the avenue for a citizen to say, um, this is a concern and this is um, not something that I expect in my local government. Um, hold on, I'm looking. I fall under the, we have to take our lumps category if we are gonna have public comment on non-agenda items and someone wants to come and tell me that they didn't appreciate my vote at the last meeting, I think but that's part of the public process. To me, that's different though. That is not, um, you can call me to task anytime you want, but you wanna say, I don't like the fact that you were, you know, Purple told me to polish. I think that's stupid. It's that to me crossing a line. It's the making sure oh, that we're, yeah. you know, that yeah. it's, it needs, it can't be a personal attack about a board member. So I wonder if that's covered under section E, because to me, section H is really um, FERPA without saying FERPA. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, make defamatory comments or use a both abusive and vulgar language towards anyone. Maybe we say towards anyone to make that more. Would that make it clearer? Yeah. Okay, it is five thirty. Oh, there we go. Um. Well, we have enough that I don't really want to rush us. Yeah. So I'm going to put those that little paragraph line and hopefully, oh no, that didn't show. Wait a minute. I can add it to the notes where we left off. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to do one. Yeah. I put a little line there too. Hopefully that will trigger some memory for me. The memory's getting hard, ladies. We still okay, have so, long ways to go, Alicia. God, it's going to be bad. <laughs> it's going to be really bad. Um, what do we want to schedule our next meeting? And and if we do, oh geez, I'm late for my five thirty. Um, let's do that by email because then we can include Jeff if that's okay. Yeah, that'd be works. great. All right, great. All right. Good luck at your next meeting. Thanks, everyone. Talk to you later. Yeah. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.